All right, welcome back to another episode of the Believe in Minnesota Football podcast, um, hosted by the starting kicker for your Golden Gophers, Matthew Trickett, and me, Tony Liebert. Um, for today's episode, we'll be recapping the Gophers' 45-17 loss to Penn State um, and previewing the uh, Week 9 matchup against uh, Rutgers. Uh, yeah, so I guess we'll just start with the game, of course. Um Third straight week that uh, kind of coming off a loss, and these podcasts are a little rougher to do. Um, but I guess from your point of view, uh, what went wrong against uh, Penn State? Yeah. Um, I, you know, it's been three straight weeks in a row with losses, and that's extremely disappointing, especially when you see the game. And, you know, I'm watching it from the sidelines, and I just noticed that our guys aren't playing to their full potential, you know. Um, not sure if that's a confidence thing, if that's a repetition thing or whatever it may be, but, you know, what you're seeing out on the field is just non-accurate representation of the skill level and the talent of the guys out there, Um I really notice it because practice is, you know, a different story. And, you know, I'm not sure if it's the atmosphere, you know, the so-called, you know, pressure of the situation, whatever it may be. Um, but I think we just play a lot better when we're loose, relaxed, and able to go out there and have fun. And I don't know if our guys have just kind of gotten away from that or whatever it is, but – it's just, it's been a little bit different on the sidelines, you know. It's a little bit more tense with the players and whatnot. And we just need to go out there and have fun and remember that we're playing a game, you know. I don't know if guys are letting external sources get to them and, you know, put all this pressure on them that they have to have these kind of numbers and do this and do that, but. I want to just go out there on Saturdays and have fun and see my teammates have fun because that's when we're at our best. Yeah, I, I mean, that's what it seemed like um, early in the year. It seemed like there was just such a positive energy. And yep. obviously on any sports team, when uh, you start having losses, um, your back's against the wall and it's a lot tougher to stay positive because – you're not getting positive results in uh, on the scoreboard. So I guess in a situation like this, I know we've talked kind of about the culture at the program and how you don't let external factors come in. But um, really on any sports team at any level, when you start losing, it comes a little easier to point fingers to guys on the team. Um, so kind of how do you guys, I guess, in the locker room avoid doing that? You know, I avoid doing that just by – remembering that each player on our team is so much more than just a football player. Everyone has their own stories, their own backgrounds, and there's so much more than what everybody else sees us as, you know? So that's really how you get to know your teammates by learning their stories, uh, learning where they come from, what they believe, stuff like that. So personally, that's how I look at it. Um, you know, we, I do a Bible study with a couple of guys on the team and, you know, you learn about your teammates more intimately that way. And you just remind yourself that we're so much more than just football. Um, everybody wants us to, you know, be perfect at football and what we do. And we definitely strive for that. But when that doesn't happen, you have to remind yourself why you are in the situation that you're in why you love football and, you know, try and share that with everybody else in the world. Yeah. It, it's interesting because obviously all these fans that you have know you as a football player and everyone who follows the team knows you as a football player. So you're almost defined by your success on the field from those people, but mm -hmm. you obviously are so much more because you do a lot more than just playing in a football game throughout your life. And like it, it's it's easy for anyone to respond after a win and uh, 
continue, I guess, the momentum going. But I think really in anyone in life and in football, it's just how you respond to losses. And because losses are bound to happen anywhere. And I think what separates successful people from non-successful people is how they react to those. Yeah, for sure. And we still have plenty to learn on that side and how we can, you know, take everything for what it is, learn from the losses, learn from the successes and grow as a team and grow together. Yeah. Um, I, I think one of the biggest stories from this game was obviously uh, Ethan making his uh, first career start. Uh, pretty intimidating atmosphere. Uh, we talked about it a little bit last week, but obviously – quite the big spot for a retro freshman to make his first college start. Um, but uh, leading up to the week, it was kind of up in the air if Tanner uh, was going to be able to play. Um, I, he obviously traveled with the team, warmed up a little bit. Uh, kind of at what point of the game did everyone on the team know that Ethan was going to start? Or was that kind of just a thing that happened like 10 minutes before? Kind of how was that in the locker room? Um, You know, I – wasn't really paying too much attention to it. Uh, I was just kind of focusing on our specialists, getting them ready, making sure I'm prepared mentally, physically, emotionally, all that. Um, but, you know, my locker in the locker room is was right across from his. Um, so I think it was before we went out for our true warm-ups, you know, and he just had his jersey on without his pads. Um so then I asked him, I was like, hey, like, good to go, good to lead today. And he's like, yep, Ethan's going to be the guy, and he's going to be on the sideline helping him out. And that's consistent with how it was. He was leading Ethan through everything and talking him through things and whatnot while he was on the sideline. So, yeah, he was uh, still heavily involved, I'd say, but not in the manner that he typically is. Yeah, I, we mentioned it last week. It was kind of a, I guess, pretty big moment for the program. First time in a long time he didn't line up under center. Um, and I, I think Ethan um, did – his performance was a lot, uh, I guess, more than you could expect for a redshirt freshman making his first start in an appearance like that. Um, he really didn't seem, I guess, like the moment was too big for him. Um, he didn't really have any blatant mistakes. Uh, obviously could have seen a few more uh, completions, but I don't think it was really even a game that you should look at the box score for his performance because obviously going to Penn State, homecoming game, whiteout atmosphere, night game, two-game losing streak back against the wall, just all this pressure. And it, it really didn't look like the moment was too big for him, and I thought – he really showed um, the potential that he has as a quarterback. And I think any Gophers fan should be excited for the future that the program has with him under center. Yeah. I mean, he definitely showed his maturity out there and, you know, I would say Tanner plays a huge role in that development and how he's able to lead Ethan. Um, but, you know, when it comes down to it, Ethan's the one out on the field and he's, the one making the decisions and whatnot. So I was happy with Ethan's performance. You know, he's got a lot of room to grow still. Um, a lot of that comes with experience, but I mean, great kid, great athlete. And uh, yeah, there's going to be a lot of great things coming out of him. Yeah. Um. So obviously outside of the quarterback position, it was uh, quite the atmosphere for the game. Kind of uh, definitely one of the craziest sporting events that I've seen live. Um, I know you mentioned that you played um, against Penn State when you were at Kent State with uh, earlier kickoff earlier in the day. Um, I guess what were your opinions on the atmosphere? How intimidating was it for you uh, walking out? Um, and kind of what did you think about the whole thing, I guess? Yeah. Um, you know, you always hear about the whiteout games. You see clips of it. You see um, – I think it was 2019 Michigan taking the uh, delay a game early on because they weren't able to hear anything. And, you know, you, you see all that on social media and it gets really hyped up and uh, really intimidating, but walking out there, um, I'm not sure if I was just 
clear head in a, you know, in a really good space. But for me, I was extremely calm, extremely calm. I was very surprised by it, but, you know, to me, it was just another game that I needed to go out there and do my job and everything. Once I crossed that white line, slowed down. Everything felt like it was in slow motion when I was out there on the field. And <laughs> I don't know how to describe it. It was it was very odd. Everything just seemed like slow. But, I mean, the atmosphere otherwise was pretty crazy. You know, you had complete whiteout. Like, it wasn't just the student section. It was literally everybody in the crowd, except for our Minnesota fans in the, what was that, top? corner of the stadium where they stick them to yeah. give them the worst seats in the house but um yeah no it's it's a fun atmosphere to play in it's something that everyone has a hopefully has a chance to play in you know when they come play college football they want to be in big time games like that and you know i'm happy that i was able to be a part of a game like that outcome obviously wasn't how i wanted it to go but it gives us more experience, you know, it gives the younger guys something big to look forward to in the future that they have been to a stadium like that in that kind of atmosphere, night game, national television, so they can learn from the guys that played in it and learn for themselves how it is on the sidelines and how they can better approach that and better prepare for that. Um, so next time they're not shocked by it and they just go out there and dominate. Yeah, like it kind of gives them, I guess, a baseline to compare uh, hard atmospheres like that too because it's the top of the top and it really doesn't get much more intimidating than that. So for those young guys, when they go to places like Iowa or Michigan or Wisconsin, they have something to base it off of, I would assume. Yeah, yeah. And I think that I mean we still have yet the last game of the season to go to Wisconsin and you know that's another huge rivalry game it'll be the last game of the season it's you know going to be of the utmost importance at the time so I mean it's just another step for our guys to learn and to hopefully take something away from that game mentally emotionally physically that they can see that they did well and improve or something that they were lacking in that they need to, you know, get with other guys on the team and learn how they handled it. If guys want to learn a little bit more mentally on how I approach the game, how I felt so calm in an atmosphere like that, hopefully they come up to me and ask me questions and stuff like that. I have, you know, one of our other specialists um, reading a book that I recommended based on your mental game and how that can be improved and how you always have to work on your mental game as well as your physical. So just little pieces of advice here and there to help our team gain an advantage. Um, Cause you never know when the game's going to be in your hands. You never know when your number is going to be called. So you just have to be ready and prepared on all aspects. Yeah. Uh, I, I obviously made the trip as well um, this week to Penn State, and it really just felt like different level of college football almost walking around the stadium before getting the full atmosphere. Um, uh, growing up in Minnesota, you get the Gophers games, and having the Division One campus in a big city like Minneapolis, it's obviously a different – pre-game atmosphere with the tailgates and stuff like that. And even the atmosphere in the stadium, like um, uh, obviously I love the Gophers atmosphere, just a little different than uh, Penn state. And when you see just this sea of uh, cars in the parking lot, one of the craziest, I think just scenes in general, like pregame just around the campus. It just, those are the moments that I think make college football special. Cause it's just, you're in the middle of nowhere in Pennsylvania and there's nothing else other than college football. It's everyone in the town uh, knows the game's happening. Everyone's 
at the game. I mean, oh, I was talking with my roommates who we went to the game with. And Happy Happy Valley or State College or whatever they call it is uh, not not that big of a city. And there was 110,000 people at the game. Probably like the whole city was in at the stadium. Oh, for sure. And, you know, as soon as we stepped off the plane, when we got there, we – you immediately recognize it's different. You know, you're looking out at a bunch of mountains or hills, yeah. whatever you want to call them, and all just – sprinkled with different colored leaves and everything in the fall and then you're driving to the stadium and it's literally nothing but a bunch of open land for a bunch of cars that are going to be pre-gaming and whatnot and then even during the game I think it was late in the second quarter where you're standing on the sideline you know watching the game and all of a sudden there's a nice breeze coming through and you just get a whiff of cow manure or horse manure or something like that. And you're like, what the hell? Like what is going on here? But yeah, it's completely different atmosphere to being, you know, downtown Minnesota. So yeah, that's something that makes college football special and unique for sure. You can travel to wherever in the country and (laughs) It can be completely different than what you're used to, but it's it's still college football. It's lovely. Yeah, I th- I think that was the biggest thing that caught me off guard going to the game is uh it really is one of those colleges that's just in the middle of nowhere, and um it, it's just the college. There's nothing else, and a lot different than a place like Minnesota or Nebraska or even Madison, and uh. It definitely was a experience that I would recommend any fan of college football to go to if they ever had the chance. Yeah. Um. So another uh, positive from the game uh, was Brevin Spanford had a big day catching the ball. Um. He obviously Dalen Wright didn't suit up with the team, so um, kind of had to rely on a few different uh, pass catchers than normal, shorthanded, but with another guy out of the lineup at receiver and uh Brevin had five catches for 68 yards both career highs and a touchdown um and it, I think just when uh there's a streak like this where you're not able to pick up wins those are kind of things you have to build off of and realize like when uh, uh Chris Ottenbell is out of the lineup and Dalen Wright's out of the lineup um, you have to rely on all these young guys. And I think Brevin's uh, proving that he's honestly one of the best tight ends in the country, I think. And at least from my point of view, he's another guy. If his role expands, I think um, you're only going to see more production from him. And he's a guy that I think in the second half of the year now could have a very big finish to the season. Yeah. And especially in games with that atmosphere, you want to rely on, guys that have seen a lot and Brev has you know he's been here a while he's he's seen a lot of football and as you said you know he's one of the top tight ends in the country and he's going to be that player for us we need big time players to step up and make plays and you know keep the game going in our direction so we can build off of drives and we can you know get eighth and confidence back at quarterback and different things like that um but yeah brevin's brevin's a great guy greater player and you know we're gonna need to hopefully rely on him a little bit more and help you know kick start some of the other guys that may be in a slump right now yeah uh, kind of, I guess, looking at the comparison between the game, if you look at the box score, it's kind of an interesting game because it's not like statistic-wise that uh, Penn State had any, like, glaring advantages. Um, outgained uh, Minnesota by 139 yards, uh, 130 yards in the air, and only – or yeah, and then about 10 on the ground. And it seemed like uh, you guys had a lot of obviously pre-snap issues early in the game with some false starts, and those won't definitely won't help. And they do add up in the end of the game. But um, Minnesota only had uh, 17 more penalty yards than 
Penn State was a number that I was kind of shocked at looking at after the game. Um, and, it, and it's just like overall, like uh, Minnesota had higher time of a time of possession, which, which is an interesting number based on the score after the game that I don't think many people would have uh, predicted. But it a game like this where on the score it looked like you got dominated, to uh, put it simple. Um, I still think there was a lot to like from this game overall and a lot to build off of for the rest of the year. Um, obviously, nobody wants a three-game losing streak in the middle of the year, but this was the toughest stretch, I think, of Minnesota's schedule. Um, the, we've talked about how deep the Big Ten is, and there's really no week off, but um, there's still a lot. I think there's just still a lot to like from this game. Yeah, and that's just another thing that I believe our guys have to understand a little bit better when – we're going into these games, you know, we know that it's going to be a close game and the score doesn't represent it, but you know, the game comparison stats, that's kind of shocking to a lot of people, especially guys on the team that probably have no idea of these numbers, but when you show it to them, they'd be kind of surprised about it, but we have to just prepare better in a way that we know that it's going to be close and it's going to come down to, uh, you know, a third down conversion here, a stop on fourth down here, and that's going to turn the tides of the game. And we just need to be a little bit more mentally prepared and emotionally prepared when things don't go our way. You know, it's really easy when we go down on the first drive, score a touchdown, we shut them down on defense, three and out, we go down and score another touchdown on offense. That's that's easy to handle. That's where, you know, guys are really excited and, oh, nobody can stop us right now, but how are you going to respond in a way when they go down in their first drive and score a touchdown and then we get shut out on offense? Like, how, how are you going to be able to see what's going on on the field, adjust, and respond to that in a way that's going to help our team win? And emotionally and mentally – are the two key aspects that I focus on when I'm trying to go out there and do my job to help the team. So that is something that I've noticed and I want to see a little bit more maturity and a little bit more growth with our team to do um, because I think that will significantly help our team. But yeah, I mean, looking at these stats right now, I would, I would not have been able to tell you any of that. <laughs> Because, as you said, it, it is shocking to see when you look at the numbers on the scoreboard at the end of the game versus the uh, box, store, box score stat comparison. Yeah, because I think it's just natural for any anybody uh, when they have lost to look at all the negatives and be like, oh, we lost 45-17, three-game losing streak. And you just think of all the things that went wrong. And, but I still think there was a lot of positives from this game. Um, I, uh, like I said earlier, nobody wants a three-game losing streak. And I think you the, you kind of just have to find where in the middle where you're motivated to now prove people wrong and your back's against the wall, but you still have things you accomplished in each game and in, in the season that you can build off of and look forward to throughout the year. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, uh, you mentioned your performance, obviously coming out, you said you were feeling loose, um, another perfect day kicking the football. Um, I'm assuming that, uh, first kick had to be a little unsure. first field goal, um, on one of the first drives into the Penn state student section had to be at least a little intimidating. I know you said you're feeling loose, but I, how happy were you with your uh, performance in the day? And I guess the specialists in general. Yeah. Um, you know, our specialists in general, I thought, did a tremendous job handling the environment. You know, you can practice all you want with the loud noise. Uh, you can't really replicate a whiteout like that in practice. So it is something that you have to do a lot more by yourself mentally to prepare for that. And especially in the specialist group, 
or your job is so precise and so exact that if you teeter in any of those aspects, you know, it can be a drastically different result. Um, so I think our specials handle that extremely well. Um, we all have different approaches in that manner. And I said, the game slowed down for me. Other guys said, you know, it sped up. It was so quick, you know, they blinked and then the play was over. So, you know, it's different for everybody, but how our specials handle it was really good. You know, uh, we punted the ball really well. We almost had that uh, muffed punt that would have, I really think, sparked something uh, early on in the game. And, you know, Dragon, once again, I think what, four for four on touchback, something like that. You really can't ask a whole lot more from what we're doing right now, but that's exactly what I'm going to keep asking of my teammates. You know, we got to do more, whether that's more leadership on the sideline or more leadership in practice. Um, but we need more. The team needs more right now. And I know that people typically don't look to the specialists for motivation or leadership or anything like that but maybe that's exactly where it needs to come from right now so we're going to continue to do our best and prepare the best we can um, physically so we can be ready and mentally emotionally maybe we need to do a better job and we need to step up to help our teammates out in aspects that they may not understand yet yeah i, I mean like I said earlier, this is kind of, I guess, the point now when you have less believers and uh, bandwagon fans than you did uh, after week four against Michigan State. And there's um, this is when you kind of have to prove to yourself who you are as a team and players and um, motivate yourself because uh, no one no, – I didn't, everyone's starting to jump ship and everyone's st stopping to believe in this team um, this season and uh, kind of looking ahead to this week, um, the game against Rutgers. And um, I kind of mentioned that I think um, an outsider would say that you guys just got through the toughest part of, of your schedule with um, Purdue, Illinois, and Penn state three of the uh, upper level teams in the big 10 um kind of I guess what's the vibe around the team and uh the season when uh you are reeling like this now and the goals you had at the start of the year might seem further away than they did a few weeks ago um and kind of how do you get prepared for an opponent like Rutgers with that mindset yeah um I believe I've touched on this earlier but we look at every game as a one game championship season and it always, we may always have, you know, those long-term goals in the back of our mind, but at the forefront of every week, we have that one and O championship season mindset. So I don't think it's going to necessarily differ any way we prepare or practice. We may personally for me, add a little bit more leadership or, um, you know, talk to different guys, offer, a different aspect of an approach or a different um, mentality on how we should be looking at the season or how we should be looking at Rutgers. But, you know, you can't take any opponent lightly in the Big Ten. And <laughs> by now, I believe everyone should understand that, you know. Yeah, I, I mean, Rutgers is really – kind of been a tough team all year. They're a team that, that won't shoot themselves in the foot. They, they won't make many mistakes. Um, they might not have the explosive level athletes that a Penn state has, or even an Illinois team has this year, but um, they're not going to give you any free opportunities. Uh, even in, uh, when they played Ohio state and they played Iowa, they played those teams really tough. Um, and they could easily even be a five and two team um, this year. Uh, they could have easily beaten Nebraska at home. And I, I think 
Greg Schiano, who's their head coach, is a guy that uh, PJ Fleck kind of learned after. Um, and he, he's building, I think, a pretty solid program um, in an area that might be hard to do that. And I think this is a game that can't really overlook. Uh, like we said, the Big Ten's deep top to bottom. Um, it might be a good game to get back on track, but the only way you can do that, I think, is looking at the one-week championship season. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be supreme focus this week on on Rutgers, as it should be every week. Um, can't overlook anybody, and special teams-wise, I've said it a couple times now, but that's where teams look to gain an advantage. So leading from the special teams group, we have to emphasize that to everyone on the team and make sure that our special teams is able to go out there and dominate and really give Rutgers no edge, no opportunity to spark anything. So we should be so dominant on special teams that, you know, it feels like that Michigan state game where we completely dominated. That's how, that's how we need to act. And that's how we need to prepare for this game. Yeah. Um, I think, if you don't have anything else to add, I think we'll wrap it up for uh, this week's ep- – or today's episode. Um, like I said, uh, Rutgers this week, uh, one thirty kickoff, I think, on uh, Big Ten Network, back at home, back at Huntington Bank Stadium. Um, Going to look to get back on track. Still a lot of football to be played for this season. So if anyone's listening to this, down on the Gophers, uh, that that's uh, – you have every right to do that because three losses – is disappointing for the players, for the fans, for anyone. No one likes losing. Um, but still a lot of football to be played and a lot of season left. Uh, as always, I guess, row the boat, Sky Uma, and go Gophers.